Thank you all. Thank you all. Uh, we're just uh, so humbled as people from Texas to get to come up here and, and experience City Church for ourselves. And what an honor it is for me and my family to be a part of it and to see what my family is doing here and uh, how uh, just how people from different areas can come together in one common theme to be able to praise the Father, to be able to lift up the Lord and to see how God has moved and worked and just, just they, you know, City Church is just uh, overnight success in just a little under 10 years, right? <laughs> so it, just to see the seeds that have been sown here and they're to continue to be sown and how Jonathan and Janie, how they saw the, the importance of, of bringing a mission team from Texas up here to be able to support and, and to be able to pour into and receive from y'all. And just, just to be able to worship with you and, and what we can do uh, and to see what, how God's moving and working here at, uh, in Montreal. And so let's just, let's, uh, I just thank you for this opportunity. And, you know, you, I, I just am amazed to, to see, to listen to this. <laughs> y'all know how blessed y'all are to get to listen to what y'all are listening to. The, the praise and worship group that y'all have here is just amazing. It's, it's mega church stuff that you're getting to experience. I mean, you have to, in the United States, you have to go to like a big, big, big church and wait and a lot, have like 18, 20, 50 people out in the parking lot parking you to be able to get to come listen to praise and worship like what you're listening to right here is just like amazing in this, in this setting, in this, in this place. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just come to you, Lord. Have your will and have your way today, Lord. Just hide me behind the cross today, Father. Your words today, not mine. Just thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for Montreal. I thank you for City Church. I thank you for the work that you're doing here. I thank you for the work that you're doing through Chris and Yancey and these wonderful people here and their heart for you, Lord. So thank you for First Baptist Church to be able to, children, to be able to see the importance and be able to come here and just be able to team up with City Church and just be able to uh, do what, what we can, Lord, just to be able to be a part of what you're doing. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. So <clears throat> in preparing for what <laughs> we're going to what, what, what I feel like that the Lord's going to say to me this morning is I thought, you know, for me and my, we, we got to watch this little, y'all got to watch, a, it's about a four-minute video, okay? And it, that basically is about 25 years of my life, my career. And to see what, how God, now that was the, that was the, that was my, what do they call it, my 30 seconds of fame, <laughs> Now, I'm going to give you, I'm going to back up, and I'm not going to try to give you every detail of the 25 years prior to that, but I'm going to give you a few of the things that I thought was very important. The importance of the, my, two things this morning. One, the importance of writing God's word on your heart, to hear what God is saying to you through his word, and how, you know, we, we were talking about, uh, Chris and I was talking about this morning, and we're talking about, you know, the, is anybody familiar with the MMA, with the, the mixed martial arts and the, the, the cage fighting? Yeah. Whether you agree with it or you don't, one thing you will have to agree on that is those guys are in tremendous shape, right? And how do they get in shape? Well, they wake up about 4 o'clock every morning, and they train all day long, and they go to bed that night, and guess what they do the next morning at 4 o'clock? They get up and they start training again all in preparation for maybe six months down the road, maybe it's five years down the road, that they will get to fight for a title. They're preparing 
constantly working on their strengths and working on their weaknesses to make them a more rounded, better fighter, right? In all of sports, that's what you do. That's what, to, to reach, reach that top level at elite, you, you always are working on your craft. You're constantly you're spending time, time spent. You want to be the best? Spend more time doing it than anybody else, right? Well, if that's true in something that's an occupation, a profession, would that not hold true with our spiritual walk with God? The importance of knowing him, relating to him as father. And it's, it's, it's basically, we were I talking to the boys this morning, Sterling Kingston. It, you know what it is? It's the, it's the attention to detail. It's the simplicity. It's the basics. I ask God every day one question. What are you saying to me today, God? What are you saying to me? And through every instance, that whatever it might be, whether it's somebody sticking a microphone in my face or whether it's a doctor sitting across the table from me, I ask God, what are you saying to me through this? Because he's speaking to us. He's speaking. And the importance, there's the importance for writing God's word on your heart, for knowing God, making it your own. You've got a wonderful, one of the best teachers in the world right here that's teaching you the scripture. I've, I've listened to a lot of them. I know. I'm, I, I listen to him myself. He's a great teacher. But guess what? He gives you a lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge. But do you know how you get understanding? You take knowledge and you put your time with it. That gives you understanding. And it tells us in the Bible, don't go get knowledge. It says go get understanding. Because when you get understanding, that's the only thing that the devil can't steal from you. When you get an understanding, I got an understanding of a few things. That roping, I understand that. I understand what it's like to put those legs in there, get me two wraps and a hooey, hands up, head down, right? Y'all like, what are you talking about? I got an understanding of that. That's just a little bit of a knowledge for y'all. I and mean, maybe not even in knowledge. You're like, what is that? I got understanding of why. I spent 25 years doing it, blood, sweat, and tears, and doing it day after, waking up at four o'clock in the morning, do it all day long, right? You, that's what we're supposed to do. We, get, we go get our understanding by putting your time with it. It's great that you get knowledge, but you've got to take it home. Monday morning, I always see Tuesday afternoon in Childress, Texas, when the wind's blowing 45 miles an hour and it's 115 degrees. There ain't nobody playing the Rocky music at that time, right? Right? That's whenever you get your understanding because you're putting your time in because there ain't nobody else around playing the music for you. There ain't no theme songs going. There ain't nobody sticking no microphones in your face. You put your time in to get your understanding. For me, I call them spiritual markers. And there's a few in my life that have been just like everybody here. We're all going through things. You've been through things, or get, guess what? You're getting ready to go through something. So we're all going on this journey. And so the, in this journey, what I feel like it's, it's important is being prepared for what's coming or what you're going through. And you've got to make it your own. You make God's word your own word. And so it's a, my spiritual markers, there's a few things that, and the, and the importance, let me, a little bit more foundation before I get into it, is the importance of a spiritual marker is, it talks a lot about this in, in the Old Testament, of laying down uh, spiritual markers. They would, they would build temples. They would build, uh, they would build altars. Why? Well, it reminded them what God brought them through and where, he, where they were and where they got to, and what he did through those tough times, not only for them, for generations to come, for the next generation and the next generation, because what we're doing now, we're setting down those spiritual markers for the next generation. We're setting the stage for the next generation, and they say that this world is, is, is going to hell in a handbasket, right? No, it's not. God's in control. He's still on his throne. He's still, he's still got a purpose. He's got a plan for each and every one of us. He's got a plan for City Church. He's very strategic in this. It's when you, there's great opposition, there's great opportunity. And there's great opposition, so that means what is it? There's great opportunity right now. 
right? So, and, and these young people, guess what he's created them to be? There's lots of giants out there, but guess what they are? You guys are giant killers. Y'all are giant slayers. So, spiritual markers. So, for me, a few of them, I've got about four, five, six, maybe 10. <clears throat> I will only hit on about four or five of them, right? But I, when these scriptures, for me, became mine at certain times of my life in when I was with this career that you saw end as the oldest guy to ever win a world championship for the first time. And I was close many times and something would happen. An injury would happen. A tragedy would happen. And I got to hear a few, th few times, your career's over with. Maybe your life's over with. And to be able to Go to God's word and go, hey, Father, Lord, what are you saying to me through this? What is it? And each and every time there was something else that came, another scripture, another word that God gave me. And it wasn't just in that time. It was the, all this preparation, that four o'clock in the morning deal. I, I, I would love to say that I got up at four o'clock in the morning, was really diligent about getting in my work. Probably wasn't as much as I was my career. But I see the importance now more and more. But those seeds that were sown to me, the people that surrounded me. <clears throat> In 1996, a scripture that jumped off the page to me is Psalms 23. And the part about, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I ride in the staff, they comfort me. Now I know of my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. I will walk through. Those were my words, walk through. Because you see, at 3 o'clock in the morning, we're driving down the highway going from one rodeo to the other. 26-year-old, two 26-year-old guys chasing their dream, right? My best friend in the, in, in the world. We got hit by a drunk, drunk, a drunk driver head on in the middle of the night, and he died right there with he. I was right there. It could have been me. I wished it would have been me sometimes. Guess what I wanted to do? I wanted to run through that valley. I didn't want to walk through it. Sometimes you want to lay down and curl up in a ball. We can't, that's not what God calls us to do. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We have to walk. Some of you are going through things right now. You just got to breathe. Just take a breath and just take a step and another step. Because you know what it says? Follows, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. That's what follows. That was one of my markers. 23rd Psalm. Another one was I sitting in the doctor's office, not the examination room. The other doctor's office where they put you, set you down at a desk. And he says to me, I understand you can do other things. Because you see, I had just had a stroke. And he was telling me I couldn't rope anymore because they didn't understand why a 32-year-old guy would have a stroke and lose his speech. But I did. And at that time, Romans 8, 28 jumped off the page to me. God works in all things. All things. He works in everything except for a stroke and a 32-year-old victim. No, he works in all things for those who love him. I'm like, I love you, Lord, for those who have been called according to his purpose. So you've called me, Lord, right? I love you. He's called me for his purpose. He's working in that situation. I didn't understand it, but I knew that God was working in all things. It meant that that word became mine at that time. You're working in all things. And from now on, every time something happens, it's like, that's, that's my go-to. God's work. This didn't surprise God. I used to think whenever I, if I ever messed up at the rodeo, like if I missed a calf, you know, missed through a, a chalupa, that's a, I missed, I mean, me miss and not win, whatever. I was like, that had to shock God. No, it didn't shock him. He knew it. He, he knew it he, because he's working in it, however that was. But so... <clears throat> Another, another instance was after I had a stroke, now we're going to have experimental heart surgery. I, I, 
a, a verse that very, very much became mine was John eleven four. 4. It's when Jesus is talking about Lazarus. Well, guess what? At that time, those words became my words because Jesus said, this sickness won't end in death, but for the glory of my father. John eleven four, 4. And I remember on my face in the shower before I'm fixing to go have experimental heart surgery at about maybe four in the morning. And I stand up and I have to go have the conversation with my wife that which is pregnant with our firstborn, our first son. This is three months before he's born and I'm going to have experimental heart surgery. I went to tell to have that talk is, hey, I don't believe that this will end in death. But if it does, then God's working in all things, right? So that's what's best for you and stone. And look at it that way. Don't look at it and it, I'll be with the Lord. And to have that conversation, to be able to know. But I stood on that word, John eleven four, 4. Sickness won't end in death, but the glory of my Father. That was another one of my spiritual markers along this journey. Guess what? Surgery went uh, perfect. There was nothing. The, the, the doctor came in and he said, uh, what was the word he said? Textbook. He said, textbook. I'm like, textbook. Yes, textbook. That's good to hear whenever they're operating on your heart, right? I got my career back. I was able to rope again. And, and this is all prior to this little interview that we got to witness there. And <clears throat> the next spiritual marker was Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek first. So, what is your, what's your first response? I, this works on me today. What's my first response in the morning? What's my first response to tragedy? What's my first response to victory? More important, what's your first response, as I put it, Children's Texas Tuesday afternoon when the wind's blowing 45 miles an hour and it's 115 degrees. What's my first response when somebody cuts me off in traffic and they Shoot me the peace, half, half of the peace sign. Half of the peace sign, okay? What's my first response? Do I give it back to them? <laughs> Do I? What's my first response in small things and big things? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. I was able to ride out of the arena. I don't know. My arm is basically pulled from my shoulder. Only thing I had connected was just the skin. I know as a roper, this is my moneymaker, right? This is the only key to my success. I got to have it. And it won't work. And I raised this arm up. This wasn't me. This was the Holy Spirit. And I said, Lord, thank you for this opportunity because I know whatever comes out of this is going to be good because I know this is bad. That was my first response. It wasn't me. It was, it was, it was, I just, that was the Holy Spirit in me speaking through me at a time that I was actually needing somebody to please help me. I know you didn't bring me this far to just bring me this far. And whatever it is, I'm excited. That's what I said. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what happens here because I know this is bad. And the only way this is going to turn out good is you're going to have to be in the middle of it. Another scripture, John 10.10, 10, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I was in a vitamin shop in Miami. After I've had the shoulder surgery, I've got the greatest horse probably that's ever been in my event. But he's old. He's an old man. So we let him walk around the house like a dog. He ate hamburgers and candy, and he was a pet. But he was the closest. Anybody remember Michael Jordan? Okay. He was like Michael Jordan of the horses, right? He's mine. I, 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 I know I got him on my team. I'm down in Miami with a trainer trying to get where I can just get my elbow off my side, where I can swing my rope again, right, from this shoulder surgery months and months later after the surgery. Jennifer gets a call. She's on the phone. We're, and we're, in, we're with this trainer uh, at the vitamin shop with this trainer. She gets a phone call, and I look across the deal, and I'm like, 
the boys okay? I can tell something's bad wrong. And she said, yeah. And I said, my mom and dad good? Your mom and dad good? Yeah, yeah. I said, my family good? Yeah. She said, we're good. I'm like, we're good then. We're good. Hit me with it. What is it? She said, Topper got out last night. His name was Topper. Topper got out last night and walked out on the highway and a truck hit him and killed him. I'm like, what? I'm like, how many more of these things? What? I'm trying to come back. I'm just trying to get where I can just, my arm will work again. And I'm down here doing what you want me to. I just walk out the emergency exit out of the back of this, this, this uh, vitamin shop into the alley. And I, there's a telephone pole there. And I just drop down on my knees. I, I said, Lord, I don't know. I'm like, come on, man. I got to have some help here. I'm like, what? What is it? What, what is this? And I, I, I'm just talking and out with God. I'm like, I don't understand this. I said, you know, best I ever remember when I bought this horse, I was just coming off of a stroke. I, he was 21 years old. I gave more money for him than I gave for my house. I, the only person that didn't think I was the craziest human in the world was my wife. She just didn't tell me, I think. But... I bought this horse, and as I'm coming home with him, I'd always wanted him my whole career, and he's an old, used-up horse. She said, if you want that horse, go buy him. If you think he's the key for your success, go get him. Man, that's all, that's all I needed here. I went down there and paid this man cash money for this horse. I'm driving home with him, and I pull over on the side of the road, and I got him out of the trailer, and I'm just standing there looking at him and thanking the Lord for him. And I said, you know what, Lord? This ain't my horse. He's yours. I'm giving him to you. He's yours. He's yours. You take him and you use him how you want to, whatever that is, whether it's for me to win a world championship or whether it's me to never be able to rope again. I don't care. I don't care. He's yours. I'm on my knees in Miami five years later in an alley talking to the Lord about this horse that had just got hit by a truck. And I said, you know what, Lord? I remember something. I gave that horse to you whenever I bought him. It says the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But the second part of that verse says, but you've come that we might have life and life abundant. The devil didn't steal that horse from me, Lord. He wasn't mine. I gave him to you. He stole him from you. What you going to do about it? (laughs) You say, man, you talk to God like that? You bet I do. He knows. He knows me. He knows I'm a hillbilly. I talk straight about things, right? Guess what happened? That video that you got to watch right there of me winning that first world championship and that was because I lost Topper. A man called me and said, I have this bay mare. That's a bay mare that I was riding. If you want her, I'll sell her to you. No way would I ever got destiny. She didn't. You know what her name was? Her name was Adelida. Adelida. I, I, I couldn't go with Adelida. Guess who named her? The trainer in Miami. I couldn't think of a name, and he said, her name's Destiny. I'm like, wow. That's my destiny right there. I won my worst world championship. And so you know what? Romans 8, 35 through 39. Who shall separate you from the love of God? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword. And then I add my part. Stroke, shoulder surgery, knee surgeries, breaking your hip, breaking your pelvis, losing your best friend to a drunk driver, losing your best horse. We're just mere little little sheep being led to the slaughter. And then the good part kicks in. Knowing all these things, we're more than conquerors through Christ who loves us. Neither life, nor death, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything in the present, nor anything in the past will be able to separate you or me from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's not my words. That's the Lord's words. And that's not just for me. That's for y'all too. That's for us. But guess what? Unless you take it and make it your own, you take it and you put your time with it. You put your, you take knowledge, you put your time with it. Then you have an understanding of it that it becomes your word. And then you can stand on that word because it's the, got the same power as what it, what it is for Jesus as it is for us. Those words are our words. 
the words that God has for us. And that's the importance of being able to spend time in God's word, knowing it for yourself, asking God, what are you saying to me today? What are you saying to me through this today, Lord? What do you have for me in this? What are you trying to say? Because he's speaking to us. He's a gentleman. He will never, he will never mash you and cause you to have to uh, receive something by force. He's a gentleman. My one last thing, I'll close with this. I'm going to read with you. I'm going to read in uh, my, one of my very favorite scriptures that represents the relationship about the Father, I think, as, as well as any, any that, parable that er, has ever been. And it's in Luke 15, verse 11. Then Jesus, it's, it's verse 11, we're going to go through 24. I'll go, I'll go fast. Oh, I got 10 minutes now. We're good. Okay. Then Jesus said, a man had two sons. The younger son said to his father, give me my share of property. So the father divided the property between the two sons. Then the younger son gathered up all that was his and traveled far away to another country. There he wasted his money in foolish living. After he had spent everything, a time came when there was no food anywhere in the country and the son was poor and hungry. So he got a job with, a, with one of the citizens there who sent the son into the field to feed pigs. The son was so hungry that he wanted to eat the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he realized, when he realized what he was doing, he thought, all of my father's servants have plenty of food, but I am here almost dying with hunger. I will leave, I will leave and return to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against you and God, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son, but let me be like one of your servants. So the son left and went to his father. Hmm, this is the good best of it right here, man. While the son was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt sorry for his son. So the father ran to him and hugged him and kissed him. The son, the son said, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I, have, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Hurry, bring the best clothes and put them on him. Also put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet and kill the fatted calf. And we're going to have a feast and celebrate. My son was dead, but now he is alive again. He was lost, but now he is found. So they begin to celebrate. I've heard a lot of people talk about this and preach on this, and they talk about the two sons. I believe the two sons represents us, and it's really not about the two sons at all because we're all not worthy. We're all messed up. The other son's just as messed up as this one that ran off and wasted all of his money. We're, we're all not worthy. It's about the father. And the main thing about the father that I see in this scripture is in verse 22, 21. While the son was still a long ways off, his father saw him and felt sorry for him. So the father ran to him and hugged him and kissed him. We have an opportunity to have a relationship with our heavenly father, with the omnipotent, omnipresent God. And if God is anything and he's everything, he's relational. And the relationship that he wants to have is with each and every one of us to, re to be able to refer and, and, and look to him as father, as dad, as daddy to be able to have that relationship that you can say in the morning, what are you saying to me today, Lord? What do you have for me? What's my assignment today, Lord? What are you speaking? What's, what is this in this situation? Because for each and every one of us, he has a destiny. He has a plan. He has a purpose for every one of us. None more important than any other but he has a plan for each and every one of us. And it is for you to take it home. You, Monday morning, 
to ask God, what do you have for me today, Lord? What are you saying to me? And surround yourself. What a wonderful blessing. What a jewel y'all have found right here in the middle of Montreal. A place of believers that are seeking God. Leaders that are looking to see what do you have for us today, Lord? Heaven's going to be great, but it's a long ways off, I hope. I need something today. I need God now. I need the Spirit to come inside of me. I want the Father to be able to speak to me and show me each and every step. And I want every day for the rest of my life. And I want as many people that I can tell about this to know what God has for them. But you got to go make it your own. You have to make the... When, but guess what? Whenever he realized, whenever the son realized and he came to the father, what did the father do? He didn't make him run up to him and bow down and do all kinds of religious things. And what did it say? The father was looking for him. He was looking. And when he saw him in the far distance, he ran to meet him. He hugged him. He kissed him. He killed the fatted calf, put clothes on his back, a ring on his finger. My son is back. That's what he thinks about each and every one of us. He just wants to have that relationship with each and every one of us. Every day. Let's pray. Father God, <clears throat> we love you, Lord. I just thank you, Father, for... <laughs> Thank you for what you're doing right here in Montreal at City Church, Lord. I thank you for these people. I thank you for the willingness to serve. I thank you for the willingness to be able to hear what you have for them every day to ask you, Lord, what are you saying to me today, Lord? Help us to be able to ever be reminded of the simplicity of that one question. What are you saying to me today, Lord? Ask Father, today, what are you saying to me today? Help us to be bold enough to be able to ask that question and then be able to step into it, Lord. Give us strength. Give us wisdom to be able to, give us the courage to be able to step into that, whatever that is that you're saying. Help us to be able to step into it, Lord. We love you and we thank you, Father. We worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>